Hello everyone, welcome. Okay, so the question I posed yesterday that uh, I, uh, I told you I was going to deal with it today and it will be in two separate uh, videos is, why is it, I'm fascinated by the question, why is it that at the end of every empire, when the empire starts declining, which is inevitable, why do we always get this moral degeneracy and sexual depravity at the end? And I said yesterday, I'm fascinated by it because I can understand how all empires, as we said, uh, you know, are born and grow and evolve and develop and then die. And we understand the political and economic reasons for it and so on. I also understand to a, to a certain extent how moral degeneracy come in because you have to, as people are revolting, you have to become more autocratic, more authoritarian, more tyrannical and so on. And then moral degeneracy comes in because at the beginning you may try to hide your wrongdoings, your, um, you know, uh, corruption or whatever. And there comes a point when to use a, a much of <laughs> too often used sentence, you, you, you cross the Rubicon, you cross the moral Rubicon in this sense. In other words, first of all, you realize that you're doing wrong, but sometimes you, you know, you're ashamed of it. Then you're no longer ashamed, but you try to hide it anyway, then whatever. And there comes a point at which you say, no, I don't care. So you saw me still in this, yes, so what? So what can you do about it? And it's, I, I dealt in many videos, I said that it's, it seems as if, not that we are <laughs> like the Roman Empire at the very end of it, not, not yet, uh, but um, that our politicians are actually doing things, I said many times, in our faces, they don't care. Um, it's like, it's like um, uh, I don't know, uh, a drug addict. First, you want to uh, cure yourself and, 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 and go for rehabilitation and whatever. And there comes a point when you say, you know, I no longer care. And you go on a binge. And, 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 and that is what happens. So I can understand that that abuse of power and then getting pleasure from inflicting your power on others more vulnerable than you are I, I I kind of get that I don't get why it is always expressed inevitably in sexual depravity which always ends up with children and you're going to see it in this book my goodness I mean why I can't quite see the connection and that is thinking about these things, what got me to, to this book, and it is Procopius, The Secret History. This is about the sixth century. The Roman Empire is well gone, but you still have an emperor and you still, you are, you are at the very, very tail end of it. The blurb at the back says, uh, this is translated by G.A. Williamson, an Oxford professor. Uh, is from 1966. I got it second hand. It's one of the advantages of living in a university town. You get all these lovely uh, second hand bookshops, and uh, I got these for £2.50. Anyway, so um, he says uh, Procopius' exposure of the vicious side of Byzantium, Constantinople today Istanbul in Turkey. Having dutifully written the official war history of Justinian's reign, Procopius turned round and revealed in the secret history the other phases of the leading men and women of Byzantium in the 6th century. Justinian, the great lawgiver, appears as a hateful tyrant wedded to an ex-prostitute, Theodora, you won't believe what he gets, what, what she gets up to. And Belisarius, the brilliant general whose secretary Procopius had been, is seen as the 
a pliable dupe of his wife Antonina, a woman as corrupt and scheming as Theodora herself. So the whole book is about four people. Justinian the Emperor, Theodora his wife the Empress, his um, uh, general, very successful general Bel Belisarius and his wife Antonina. Belisarius very courageous in war but at home, my goodness, he was a slave to his wife. Both of them, as a matter of fact, practically slaves to their wives. So. So I'm going to do two videos on this and then hopefully we will be able to answer the question because here you see tremendous abuse of power, tremendous corruption and tremendous sexual depravity everywhere. So The Secret History is a remarkable work, informative and interesting vivid and original, but presenting us with most unusual problems. The author came to write a book which seems to fly in the face of all that he had written before and to be still more difficult to reconcile with what he wrote later. He had written volumes and volumes about the history of everything. And then I will read you his foreword, which is not very long, and you will see why he couldn't publish this book. He explains it. So why is this book so different from all the others, the other seven volumes? Did he change his mind? Did he at any stage believe what he was writing? Was he writing for different groups of readers? Was he really the author of all the books? Or has his name been mistakenly attached to the middle one, which seems to sort of uh, so will, uh, soar so well with the others? This too is a problem which we are not yet in a position to tackle. Leaving all these problems aside for the present, let us take a general look at our author and his book. Procopius lived at an eventful time a time that stands out in history because it was the death of the classical period and the birth of the Middle Ages. In the days of his father, the western half of the Roman Empire had already collapsed. Okay, Then uh, I will just jump on a little bit. There are those who explain the course of history by reference to economic and other material causes. For Procopius, history was made by persons, sometimes by God himself, but generally by human beings, swayed by human passions, though perhaps subject to demonic influences. This is because at the end, when he has explained everything that these two especially have done, and the situation in the empire as it was, he actually ends up saying, is this, what is going on? Is this demonic? Could it be that there is some satanic forces at work? I mean, some of us are asking this now. So uh, that is the, the references. Um, his books are not biographies, but histories in which events both on the battlefield and in cities palaces and homes are set down in the greatest detail, but they are primarily books about persons. This is true of this secret history even more than the other works. Here we read of little else than the moti doings, motives and characters of two men and two women. And the many others who make brief appearances in the pages of this little book are introduced solely because of what they did on behalf of these four or suffered at their hands. The two men were Justinian, sometimes called the Great, for 47 years ruler of the Roman Empire, and Belisarius, the outstanding soldier of his day, and one of the greatest generals who ever commanded the armies of the Romans. The two women, so important because of their dominating characters and total lack of principle, were Theodora, 
For 25 years, the consort of Justinian and joint ruler of the empire, and Antonina, the irresistible enchantress whose husband Belisarius was powerless in her hands. And he begins by saying that at the beginning of the Republic, you had the princeps, or princeps, the uh, meaning uh, prince, but meaning the first among equals and then eventually that came to dominus the the lord and master and the beginning of corruption simplicity gave way to pomp and majesty western dignity to oriental splendor the princeps became the dominus lord and master and his fellow citizens his subjects and bond servants the linen toga was replaced by elaborately adorned garments of silk the headband or wreath by a jewel crown before his majesty even the noblest must make humble obeisance and all right so you see the beginning before Justinian, his, his uh, uncle, Justin, was the ruler, before him, Anastasius. And Anastasius, in 491, is introduced, uh, yes, his, he, he mentions him because he provides a contrast to what Justinian is going to be. The former... Anastasius filled the treasury, the latter emptied it. The former made ample provision for the soldiers on active service, the latter starved and robbed them. Of Justin, Justinian's uncle, there was more to be said because as uncle to Justinian he made it possible for Justinian to succeed him. He allowed his nephew to be virtual ruler of the empire throughout his own nominal reign and made him officially joint emperor some months before his death. Moreover, by tampering with the law, he enabled the foolish young man to wed the unspeakable Theodora and so to bring miseries untold upon the Roman people. Justinian had married Theodora four years before their accession to the throne, having persuaded his uncle to abolish the long-established law forbidding a senator to marry a harlot, which all the world knew that Theodora was. Justinian was 39 or 40, Theodora only 20, perhaps not even that. She had uh, packed, but she had packed a great deal into those few years. She had been born in Byzantium, or as some said, in Cyprus, the home of Aphrodite. Her father was a bear feeder, feeder in the um, um, amphitheater. Okay, so he was in the circus. At a very early age, she went on the stage as a knockabout comedienne, and. At first, at the first possible moment, became, like her two sisters, a prostitute of the lowest type, giving herself up to three different vices, one of them unnameable even in our own outspoken days. That is in 1966 that the translator is writing this. Her vulgarity was appalling and her lust, if Procopius is to be believed, unparalleled and insatiable. We need not anticipate here his detail and revolting description. She conceived repeatedly and, except on one unfortunate occasion, succeeded in murdering her unborn children. Then she met Justinian, who became her helpless slave made her his mistress, and as soon as permission was given, took her to be his wife. Um, she was universally feared. 
Specifically, as she appears to have been bloodthirsty, merciless and sadistic. Procopius has much to say on this subject and says it with vigor and emphasis. And his evidence on this point, as in the matter of her conduct before marriage, is corroborated by a number of Greek and Latin writers of quite early date, one of whom tells us, for instance, that she swore by the Almighty to flay a certain messenger alive. At the same time, she was credited with great generosity towards the poor, but it is easy to be generous if one has enough left to satisfy every whim and no scruples at all about piling up vast wealth at the expense of other people. Whatever she was, uh, like as a wife, Theodora made a very unsatisfactory parent. As we have seen, she regularly practiced abortion. On one occasion, she failed to take the necessary measures in time and bore a son to one of her lovers who acknowledged the child as his and knowing only too well the ferocity and unscrupulousness of the youthful mother carried him off to the safety of Arabia. After the father's death, the boy ventured to return to Byzantium. His mother took one look at him, and he was never seen again. She also gave birth to a daughter, presumably when she was mistress or wife of Justinian, etc. Anyway, she extended to her own offspring the cruelty that she had practice throughout her reign against one person or another and against every class of her subjects. So her daughter and her granddaughter would be the same. Uh, it was, there were bad times. To spend money, public money, uh, was like fiddling while Rome burned, the translator says. So, let me then go back to the beginning. This is the introduction. But let me just go back. Okay. However great the defects of the book may be, there is no denying that for those who wish to know how men lived in other times and places and are prepared to read of things that were sordid and disgusting, it makes most interesting reading. We find in it not only political and military history, not only scandalous stories, diatribes and insinuations, but also vivid descriptions of life in that far-off age. Byzantium was full of beauty and magnificence, full too of moral and religious corruption. We get an insight into the sad state of the church, the despicable characters of certain prelates, the criminal methods employed to augment church funds. We read of a city where sexual morality was apparently non-existent, where adultery and promiscuity were rampant and chastity unknown, where the laws of God and the example of Christ had been long forgotten, and the pagan adage, let nothing be in excess, had ceased to have any meaning. To read of these things will do us no harm. The only harmful books are those which make wrong seem attractive or represent sin as being other than the hideous thing than it, that it is. Procopius was unquestionably on the side of right and the things which are disgusting to us were equally disgusted, disgusting to him. So it's just a question of having an obligation to know rather than look away, however ugly it might be. Apart from the widespread indifference to religion and morality, the reader will find in Procopius many things, not all of them objectionable, to remind him of life today. He will read of social services with state-employed doctors and teachers and subsidized entertainments, of elaborately organized postal services, 
of espionage and counter-espionage, of rates and taxes, custom offices, import duties and prohibited imports, of defective street lightning and inadequate water supplies, of monopolies, price fixing, rake-offs, under-the-counter sales and the cornering of supplies, of the rising cost of living and depreciation of the currency, of a smaller loaves and adulterated flour, of a statue of limitations, of a mad passion for sport and the frantic and aggressive partisanship of its devotees. We can actually compare. All we have to do really is, because you see human nature doesn't change, does it? I mean, we, we laugh and cry and hate and love as they did. We may love and hate different things, but we still love and hate. And usually about the same things. We go back to envy, all, all that sort of thing. So it hasn't really changed that much. But as instead of, um, the way I'm reading it is that instead of just reading about one person, one emperor, I'm looking at, I'm comparing it in my mind to the ruling class as it is. We no longer have one absolute emperor who can do and undo whatever he wants. But we do, we have always had, and history is like that, a ruling class, those above. And what has changed in our time is that our ruling class, which was a national ruling class, is now a transnational ruling class. Okay, So um, the, the, uh, the country, the state, is, is uh, very much a province, as it were. Okay, but so this is the way I'm reading it. When I, when I'm reading about Justinian, I'm thinking of the present ruling class. I think of always of, for example, man power, women authority, man mind, woman soul ruling class this power and women culture each one brings uh, its own interpretation and so I'm looking at Justinian as the present ruling class and I'm looking at Theodora at it as uh, the culture that we are all experiencing what is going on in society at the moment and perhaps that makes more sense or brings it uh, to, to the present. The author himself says, um, this is why I'm going to use two videos, okay, because I can't cover everything in one, but in the foreword he says, the purpose of this book, in recording everything that the Roman people have experienced in successive wars up to the time of writing, I have followed this plan, that of arranging all the events described as far as possible in accordance with the actual times and places. But from now on I shall no longer keep to that method. In this volume I shall set down every single thing that has happened anywhere in the Roman Empire. The reason is simple. As long as those responsible for what happened were still alive, it was out of the question to tell the story in the way that it deserved. For it was impossible either to avoid detection by swarms of spies or if caught to escape death in its most agonizing form. Indeed, even in the company of my nearest relations, I felt far from safe while writing. Then again, in the case of many events, which in my earlier volumes I did venture to relate, I dare not reveal the reasons for what happened. So in this part of my work, I feel it my duty to reveal both the events here to passed over in silence and the reasons for the events already described. 
But as I embark on a new understanding of a difficult and extraordinary baffling character, concerned as it is with Justinian and Theodora, and the lives they lived, they, they lived, my teeth chatter, and I find myself recoiling as far as possible from the task. For I envisage the probability that what I am now about to write will appear incredible and unconvincing to future generations. And again, when in the long course of time the story seems to belong to a rather distant past, I am afraid that I shall be regarded as a mere teller of fairy tales or listed among the tragic poets. One thing, however, gives me confidence to shoulder my heavy task without flinching. My account has no lack of witnesses to vouch for its truth, for my own contemporaries are witnesses fully acquainted with the incidents described and will pass on to future ages an incontrovertible conviction that these have been faithfully recorded. And yet... There was something else which, when I was all agog to get to work on this volume, again and again held me back for weeks on end. For I inclined to the view that the happiness of our grandchildren would be endangered by my revelations, since it is the deeds of the blackest die that stand in greatest need of being concealed from future generations, rather than they should come to the ears of monarchs as an example to be imitated. For most men, in positions of power invariably, through sheer ignorance, slip readily into imitation of their predecessors' vices, and it is to the misdeeds of earlier rulers that they invariably find, find it easier and less troublesome to turn. But later on, I was encouraged to write the story of these events by this reflection. It will surely be evident to future monarchs that the penalty of their misdeeds is almost certain to overtake them, just as it fell upon the persons described in this book. He goes on and he ends, that is my justification for first recounting the contemptible conduct of Belisarius and then reveal, revealing the equally contemptible conduct of Justinian and Theodora. <coughs> okay, so He starts with Justin, who was, uh, what sort of people were Justinian and Theodora? And how did it come about that they destroyed the greatness of Rome? These are the questions that I must, must answer next. Justin had been... Um, First of all, a slave, he made it to the army, then to the palace guards. This is um, Justinian's uncle. Uh, the emperor Anastasius gave him command of the palace guards, and when he himself passed from the scene, Justin, on the strength of his command, succeeded to the throne, though he was by now a doddering old man, totally illiterate. In popular parlance, he didn't know his ABC, an unheard of thing in Rome, in a Roman also. Okay, so, but he had, uh, he didn't reign for too long, seven years, and four of those, Justinian, his nephew, was co-emperor. As this shocking state of affairs continued and no notice was taken uh, was uh, taken of the offenders by the authority in charge of the city, the audacity, he's talking about things, uh, terrible crimes that were happening in the city, the audacity of these men increased by leaps and bounds. For when nothing is done to discourage wrongdoing, there is of course no, no limit to its growth. This was um, a group of men called the Blues, who were like the um, the brown shirts or the black shirts of uh, the, the, the people who, groups of youngsters who go about 
um, in in times of trouble who go about killing people and uh, influencing others and Tifa so on. For when nothing is done to discourage wrongdoing, there is of course no limit to its growth. Even when punishment does follow offenses, it does not often put an end to them altogether. It is natural for most people to turn easily to wrongdoing. So you have gangs, okay? And nothing was being done. And the people were petrified. That is how things went with the blues. Of their opponents, some came over to their faction through a desire to join in their criminal activities without paying any penalty. Others took to flight and slipped away to other countries. Many who were caught in the city were put out of the way by their opponents or executed by the authorities. Many other young men poured into this organization. They had never before shown any interest in such things, but ambition for power and unrestrained license attracted them to it. For there is no one revolting crime known to men which was not at that time committed and left unpunished. All these went on no longer in darkness. First of all, in darkness, now in the open air. Or out, uh, All these went on no longer in darkness or out of sight, but at any moment of the day and in every part of the city, and the most eminent citizens, as often as not, were eyewitnesses to what was happening. There was no need to keep the crimes concealed, since the criminals were not troubled at all by any fear of punishment. In fact, they were actually moved by a spirit of rivalry, so that they organized this place of brawn and toughness to show that with a single blow they could kill anyone they met unarmed. And no one now could expect to live much longer amidst amid the, the dangers that daily threatened him. Constant fear made everyone suspect that death was just round the corner. No place seemed safe, no time could guarantee security, since even in the most revered churches and at public festivals, people were being senselessly murdered, and confidence in kith and king was a thing of the past for many perished through the machinations of their nearest relatives. No inquiry, however, was held into the crimes committed. The blow invariably fell without warning, and the falling had no one to avenge them. No law or contract retained any force on the secure basis of established order, but everything turned to growing violence and confusion and the government was indistinguishable from a tyranny. Not, however, a stable tyranny, but one that changed every day and was forever starting afresh. The decisions of the magistrates suggested the paralysis of fear. Their minds were dominated by dread of a single man, while juries, when selling questions in dispute, base their verdicts not on their notions of what was just and lawful, but on the relations, hostile or friendly, which each of the disputants had with the partisans. For any juror who disregarded their injunctions would pay the penalty with his life. Many creditors were under irresistible pressure to return the written agreements to their debtors without recovering a penny of the debt, and many people to their chagrin had to free their domestic servants, and it is said that a number of women were forced by their slaves to yield to many suggestions most repugnant to them. And by now the sons of men in high positions, after associating with these these young criminals compelled their fathers to do a number of things that were most reluctant to do themselves, and particularly to hand over their money to them. 
Many unwilling boys, with the full knowledge of their fathers, were forced into immoral relations with the partisans, and women who were happily pain women who were happily married suffered the same humiliation. It is said that one woman, very elegantly attired, was sailing with her husband to one of the suburbs on the mainland opposite, and during this crossing the partisans intercepted them, tore the lady from her husband's arms, and carried her to their own boat. Before going on board with the young men, she whispered encouragement to her husband and told him to have no fear on her account. She would never submit to physical outrage. Then, while her husband was still watching her through his tears, she jumped overboard and from that moment was never seen again. So crime about it. Such then was the state of affairs in Byzantium and everywhere else. For like any other disease, the infection that began in the capital rapidly spread all over the Roman Empire. The emperor took no notice at all of what was going on, since he was a man incapable of perception. Although he was invariably an eyewitness of all that happened in the hippodromes, for he was extremely simple, with no more sense than a donkey, ready to follow anyone who pulled the rein, who pulls the rein, waving its ears all the time. And while Justinian behaved in this way, he was making a mess of everything else. He had no sooner seized upon his uncle's authority than he began to squander public money in the most reckless manner and with the greatest satisfaction, now that he had got got it in his hands. From time to time he came in contact with the some, some of the Huns and showered money on them for services to the state. The inevitable result was that the Roman territory was exposed to constant incursions. For after tasting the wealth of the Romans, these barbarians could never again keep away from the road to the capital. Again, he did not hesitate to throw vast sums into erecting buildings along the seafront in the hope of checking the constant surge of the waves. He pushed forward from the shore by heaping up stones in his determination to defeat the onrush of the water and in his efforts to rival, as it were, the strength of the sea by the power of wealth. He gathered into his own hands the private property of all the Romans in every land, either accusing them of some crime they had never committed, or coaxing them into the belief that they had made him a free gift. Many who had been convicted of murders and other capital crimes made over to him their entire property, and so escaped without paying, paying the penalty of their offences. Others, who were perhaps laying claim without any justification to lands belonging to their neighbours, found it impossible to win judgment against their opponents because they had no legal case. So they actually made the emperor a present of the property in dispute and got clear of the whole business. They themselves, by generosity that cost nothing, secured an introduction to his majesty and by the most unlawful means managed to get the better of their opponents. So, um, okay. He says that he was, he was both prone to evil doing and easily, easily led straight, both knave and fool, to use a common phrase. He never spoke the truth himself to those he happened to be with, but in everything that he said or did, there was always a dishonest purpose. Yet to anyone who wanted to deceive him, 
he was easy meat. He was by nature an extraordinary mixture of folly and wickedness inseparably blended. This perhaps was an, uh, an instance of what one of the peripatetic philosophers suggested many years ago, that exactly opposite qualities may, on occasions, be combined in a man's nature, just as in the blending of colors. However, I must limit my description to facts of which I have been able to make sure. Well, then, this emperor was dissembling, crafty, hypocritical, secretive by temperament, two-faced, a clever fellow with a marvelous ability to conceal his real opinion and able to shed tears not from any joy or sorrow but employing them artfully when required in accordance with the immediate need, lying all the time. Not carelessly, however, but confirming his undertaking both with his signature and with the most fearsome oaths, even when dealing with his own subjects. But he promptly disregarded both agreements and solemn pledges, like the most contentable slaves, who, by fear of the tortures hanging over them, are driven to confess misdeeds that they have denied on oath a treacherous friend and an in inexorable enemy, he was passionately devoted to murder and plunder, quarrelsome and subversive in the extreme, easily led astray into evil ways by refusing every suggestion that he should follow the right path. How could anyone find words to describe Justinian's character? These vices, and many yet greater, he clearly possessed to an inhuman degree. It seemed as if nature had removed every tendency to evil from the rest of mankind and deposited it in the soul of this man. In addition to everything else, he was far too ready to listen to false accusations and quick to inflict punishment, for he never ferreted out the facts before passing judgment, but on hearing the accusations immediately had his verdict announced. Without hesitation, he issued orders for the seizure of women and towns, the burning of cities and the enslavement of entire nations for no reason at all, so that if one chose to add up all the calamities which had befallen the Romans from the beginning and to weigh them against those for which Justinian was responsible, I feel sure that he would find that a greater slaughter of human beings was brought about by this one man than took place in all the preceding centuries. As for other people's money, he seized it by stealth without the slightest hesitation, for he did not even think it necessary to put forward any excuse or pretense of justification before taking possessions of things to which he had no claim. Yet, when he had secured the money, he was quite prepared to show his contempt for it by reckless prodigality or to throw it to potential enemies without the slightest need. In short, he kept no money himself and allowed no one else in the world to keep any, as if he were not overcome by avarice but held fast by envy of those who had acquired the money. Thus he cheerfully va banished wealth from Roman soil and became the creator of nationwide property. He married a wife whose origin and upbringing I must now explain, and how, after becoming his consort, she destroyed the Roman state root and branch. His fa her father had been in the circus, and he had three daughters. This is Theodora's father. And when the children were old enough, they were at once put on the stage there by their mother, as their appearance was very attractive. 
Not all at the same time, however, but as each one seemed to her to be mature enough for this profession. The eldest one, Comito, was already one of the most popular harlots of the day. Theodora, who came next, clad in a little tunic with long sleeves, the usual dress of a slave girl, used to assist her in various ways, following her about and invariably carrying on her shoulders the bench on which her sisters habitually sat at public meetings. For the time being, Theodora was still too underdeveloped to be capable of sharing a man's bed or having intercourse like a woman. But she acted as a sort of male prostitute to satisfy customers of the lowest type and slaves at that, who, when accompanying their owners to the theater, seized their opportunity to divert themselves in this revolting manner. And for some considerable time she remained in a brothel, giving up to this unnatural bodily commerce. But as soon as she was old enough and fully developed, she joined the women on the stage and promptly became a courtesan of the type our ancestors called the dregs of the army. For she was not a flautist or harpist, she was not even qualified to join the corps of dancers, but she merely sold her attractions to anyone who came along putting her whole body at his disposal. Later, she joined the actors in all the businesses of the theatre and played a regular part in their stage performances, making herself the butt of their rival buffonery. She was extremely clever and had a biting wit and quickly became popular as a result. There was not a particle of modesty in the little hussy that's what it says here. And no one ever saw her taken aback. She complied with the most outrageous demands, without the slightest hesitation. And she was the sort of girl who, if somebody walloped her or boxed her ears, would make a jest of it and roar with laughter. And she would throw off her clothes and exhibit naked to all and sundry those regions both in front and behind, which the rules of decency require to be kept veiled and hidden from masculine eyes. She used to tease her lovers by keeping them waiting and by constantly playing about with novel methods of intercourse, she could always bring the lascivious to her feet. So far from waiting to be invited by anyone, she encountered she by anyone she encountered she herself by cracking dirty jokes and wiggling her hips suggestively would invite all who came her way especially if they were still in their teens never was anyone so completely given up to unlimited self-indulgence Often she would go to a bring-your-own-food dinner party with ten young men or more, all at the peak of their physical powers and with fornication as their chief object in life, and would lie with all her fellow diners in turn the whole night long. When she had reduced them all to a state of exhaustion, <laughs> she would go to their menials as many as thirty on occasions and copulate with every one of them but not even so could she satisfy her lust one night she went into the house of a distinguished citizen during the drinking and it is said before the eyes of all the guests she stood up on the end of the couch near their feet pulled up her dress in the most disgusting manner, and she stood there and brazenly displayed her lasciviousness. And though she brought three openings into service, she often found fault with nature, grumbling because nature had not made the openings in her nipples wider than is normal, 
so that she could de oh my goodness <laughs> so that she could devise another variety of intercourse in that region naturally she was frequently pregnant but by using pretty well all the tricks of the trade she was able to induce immediate abortions Often in the theater, too, in full view of all the people, she would throw off her clothes and stand naked in their midst, having only a girdle about her private parts and her groins, not, however, because she was ashamed to expose this also to the public, but because no one is allowed to appear there absolutely naked. A girdle round the groins is compulsory. With this minimum covering, she would spread herself out and lie face upwards on the floor. Servants on whom this task had been imposed would sprinkle barley grains over her private parts, and geese trained for the purpose used to pick them off one by one with their bills and swallow them. Theodora, so far from blushing when she stood up again actually seemed to be proud of this performance for she was not only shameless herself but did more than anyone else to encourage shamelessness many times she threw off her clothes and stood in the middle of the act uh, in in the middle of the actors on the stage leaning over backwards or pushing out her behind to invite both those who had already enjoyed her and those who had not been intimate as yet, parading her own special brand of gymnastics. With such lasciviousness did she misuse her own body that she appeared to have her private parts not like other women in the place intended by nature, but in her face. And again, those who were intimate in her face, and again, those who were intimate with her showed, her showed by so doing that they were not having intercourse in accordance with the laws of nature. And every person of any decency who happened to meet her in the forum would swing around and beat a hasty retreat for fear he might come in contact with any of her garments and so appear tainted with this pollution. For to those who saw her, especially in the early hours of the day, she was a bird full of ill omen. And for her fellow actresses, she habitually and constantly stormed at them like a fury, for she was malicious in the extreme. Such then was the birth and upbringing of this woman, the subject of common talk among women of the streets and among people of every kind. But when she arrived back in Byzantium, Justinian conceived an overpowering passion for her. At first he consorted with her only as a mistress, though he did promote her to patrician rank. This at once enabled Theodora to possess herself of immense influence and of very considerable wealth, for, as so often happens to men consumed with passion, it seemed in Justinian's eyes the most delightful thing in the world to lavish all his favours and all his wealth upon the object of his passion. And the whole state became fuel for his passion. With Theodora to help him, he impoverished the people far more than before, not only in the capital but in every part of the empire. As both had long been supporters of the blue faction, they gave the members of this faction immense powers over state affairs. I'm going to leave it there. That was just an introduction today of an introduction to the characters and we are going to see their crimes and so on later on hopefully being able to answer this question of mine about um, moral degeneracy always leading to sexual depravity and why thank you so much bye bye I hope I haven't shocked you. There were things there that um, 
I hadn't quite read myself carefully enough. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.